T-minus five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third uh, edition of A Bridge to the Future. And we're going to be talking about the economics of space exploration and development and migration. And my guests, I have two guests today, Matt Weinzerl and Brendan Rousseau. Matt has a lot of titles. I'm going to give them to you. Uh, he is the Joseph and Jacqueline Ebeling Professor of Business Administration, the Senior Associate Dean, and Chair of the MBA program at Harvard Business School. And I don't know how he has time to write about space, but he does. And uh, uh, Brendan is a researcher, teaching assistant at Harvard Business School. I'm always really interested in what draws people to this topic and uh, I do a little presentation with a journalist named Rod Pyle and we call it space hates people but people love space and I think it kind of sums up the situation so how did the two of you get into uh, loving space I, I guess I'll start with you Matt well, thank you, Frank. And first, let me thank you for having us on the podcast, for the really kind introduction. Uh, for our listeners out there, I had the pleasure of meeting Frank. Frank, how many years ago? Was it maybe five years ago or something at this point? Ago, yeah. Uh, when I was first really starting to start thinking about space. And of course, given Frank's uh, affiliation with Harvard over the years, someone whom, who found out I was interested in space said, you have got to meet Frank White. And so that was one of my first uh, expert uh, discussions at a diner in the suburbs of Boston, uh, and it was a wonderful, a wonderful moment uh, to meet Frank. So we're really glad to be here, uh, Frank. To answer your question, uh, I'm <laughs> of all things a tax theorist, uh, and so uh, maybe the only thing as boring as space is exciting is tax theory. But uh, I was teaching a course at Harvard Business School on economic policy and the role of the government in the economy as an outgrowth of my interest in tax theory. And as part of that course, I'm very interested in how the public and private sectors work with each other and complement each other or not. And I started noticing space activity that was run by companies, SpaceX landing, uh, landing rockets on barges in the ocean. And I'd always thought that space was a purely public play. And so I started getting interested as an economist in what was happening in this sector that uh, I think we're all fascinated in at some level. Uh, but that I got interested in from a professional standpoint. Very good. And I have to say, I'm kind of glad that you discovered space exploration. Uh, I have nothing against taxes per se, but <laughs> I do think space is a lot more interesting. Uh, Brendan, how about you? How'd you get into the field? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And I think it's it's funny you say that. Uh, Frank, because I, when I first walked into Matt's office, I noticed that although he has this, you know, huge repertoire and deep body of knowledge on taxes, all the art in his office is of space. You know, I was surprised not to see W2s posted on the walls and everything. So, yeah. uh, an interesting sign. Um, I've been interested, like many people in space, for a long, long time. Um, ever since I was a kid, um, you know, just growing up on space media and being interested in space. Um, my first love was astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, I really loved it from the, the hard science side. And then around the same time as Matt, I realized that there's something really special going on uh, with the privatization of space. It's opening up new uh, horizons. Um, and so as well as the degree in uh, astronomy, I got a degree in economics to really understand what's going on. And um, I've really been on this journey ever since. Uh, I was lucky to discover Matt when I was writing my thesis on uh, evolution of funding for space projects. And it turns out if you look up space and economics, uh, Matt's name <laughs> at the time was pretty much the, the first one that came up. Uh, and uh, I've been lucky to join him uh, for our little experiment here at uh, Harvard Business School. Well, that's really great. I'm glad that the two of you are working together and 
<laughs> there's a lot to write about. So I'm sure you'll never run out of topics at this point. It's an ever expanding field. Um, well, let's get into it. Uh, you know, Matt, I was interested in your article, which was one of the first articles I read that you had written or papers. You called it Space, the Final Economic Frontier. And I like the framework you laid out for understanding the space economy. And you talked about, number one, you establish the market through decentralization. Number two, refine the market through policy. And three, temper the market through regulation. Could you talk a little bit more about the framework and what those three ideas really come down to, what they mean in a modern context? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Uh, happy to talk about this. And this is where, you know, the economist in me will come out. And if any of your listeners are economists or remember their economics training, they'll they'll recognize the basic idea. It's it really stems from the way that economists understand why the market is so powerful, but also why the state is such an important actor, which is that under certain conditions, uh, the market is an unparalleled force for efficiency and innovation and growth. Uh, and Economists have fancy ways of talking about that and proving that mathematically, et cetera, but uh, it really goes all the way back at least to Adam Smith and even further in terms of the invisible hand and uh, terms that'll be familiar to your listeners. And that's really the first step in that three-part framework, which is the space industry for its first 40, 50 years was the opposite of a sort of free market. There was a, a lot of centralization, a lot of government control, not for bad reasons. I mean, we can all... We can walk through exactly why that was perhaps even necessary, but certainly desirable. Um, but what we've started to see is the decentralization of the space sector and the bringing in of market forces. Uh, and if we're trying to build a space economy, that's going to have huge benefits. And so that's the first part. Let's decentralize the system and let the market do work some of its magic. The next two parts um, are really about the fact that markets aren't perfect, that they often fail in various ways. And so... Uh, the first part about refining the market says that sometimes markets are just inefficient. They actually leave money on the table for various reasons that we can go into if you want, but we certainly go into in the article. And so the government can help um, by helping the sector capture complementarities or avoid negative spillovers and things like that. And then the third part is that even if markets are efficient, uh, sometimes they give us outcomes that we don't like very much. Uh, just because markets are amoral and uh, make decisions that we might disagree with. And so we might want to regulate the market or temper the market in ways that are consistent with our social priorities. And that, that article came out in 2018 uh, in uh, the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Do you think it holds up today? Do you think <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Right. You asked also, how is it relevant today? I mean, I will say the beauty of, I think, part of the beauty of economics and something I've learned a lot, actually, by trying to extend my economics lens to a totally new place, namely the space sector, is that economics is, or at least economics uh, key ideas are universal and timeless. Uh, so, you know, space is a sector, space is a whatever, but in some ways, space is just another place. And economics works in space just like it does everywhere else. And it works today just like it did in 1776 when Smith was writing. So I think the framework certainly holds up. And uh, we've used it a lot, Brendan and I, in designing the course that we teach now at HBS on the space sector, sort of thinking about how to make it an intellectually coherent course that takes students through key questions in space. And I have to say, you know, this is probably just a mark of uh, my uh, many years thinking like an economist, but when people ask me about, about space questions, my mind immediately goes to essentially this framework and how can I use that to help think through the question they're asking. Yeah, you know, I'm reminded of a conference I went to at MIT down the road from you. And uh, one of the speakers said, if you really want to understand the space business, drop the word space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was making a similar point. Uh, Brendan, you kind of chuckled when I asked if it was still relevant. Uh, what came to mind for you about the framework? Yeah, I was laughing because I, we were using it this morning uh, to, <laughs> to think about uh, the context of uh, a case study that we're writing now. So it, it's 
it's uh, I'm glad that Matt came up with that framework because it's been extremely helpful. Yeah. Well, it's good, and I agree with you. I, you know, my thing is communications, and I'm using frameworks that I learned 20, 30 years ago, honestly, because even though the technology changes dramatically, and it certainly has in my field, I can still use certain concepts that that do hold up. Uh, you know, another uh, paper or case that you wrote was about early angel investors, which was really interesting. Now, that was interesting for a couple of reasons. One is, it seems like the very early pioneers in that area had a vision, a dream, and that's why they were investing. But it does seem to have evolved to a different kind of investor who wants a return. I'm curious if you could say more about that. And I'm curious, are there any people you think of today who really have both? They're visionaries and they want to have a return on their investment. That would obviously be a, an interesting person or a group. Sure, I'll start us off and then Brendan, you can jump in here. I, I love the way you phrase that, Frank, because one of the more striking illustrations of this is that when we first wrote the case to which you're referring, the case is about a company that at the time was called Space Angels, uh, and now it's Space Capital, basically. So I think, you know, we've moved from angels to capitalists, uh, and and that's probably a good thing in terms of the maturation of the sector. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of people who combine both views, I, I think a lot of space investors have within them that passion, that excitement, it's probably how they get into it, not all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I know your first guest was Dylan Taylor, and he exemplifies for me a person who has both parts of those uh, in spades. So, Brendan, I don't know if you want to add anything else to it. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting uh, question. And part of me feels a little bit sad about that, that, you know, it's space is becoming more of a business. It's, it's less of um, a, a realm for idealists and, and dreamers. So part of me might be a little bit sad about that, but I am more happy than sad because I think the more it becomes a business, the more that good ideas can get funded. Um, the horizons of what we can do uh, just get uh, expanded. I, I think back to um, the early days of NASA and, and uh, our space program when really there were a lot of dreamers trying to get good ideas funded that took us so far until uh, you know the people pulling the purse strings um, said, okay, um, that chapter has closed. I think to the extent that you know now market forces can keep good ideas funded and keep uh, dreamers uh, dreams alive, um, that's a, a really positive thing. Yeah, I think that's right. I just, I just one other thing I was thinking um, is about SPACs because some of your listeners may may remember the SPACs uh, boom of recent years. And I, in, maybe at one level, that's sort of the last gasp of the sort of angel phase of space. You know, where just pure interest got people excited about it, um, and they didn't pay as much attention to the returns. I think obviously with the credit crunch we're in now, you know, some of that's getting rung out of the system. And again, frothy markets can be great. They can fund lots of exciting stuff. So I don't think it was a bad thing to go through that phase at all for the space sector, but maybe now we're into a more sustainable, uh, reasonable, right. rational era. Yeah. Well, you may have seen the, the latest fact closed this morning. Uh, so we might still be in the last uh, the last phases of that. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Well, I will say that my my interest in space exploration and everything that goes with it goes back to uh, being a kid uh, like you, Brendan. But my active involvement goes back to the 70s and 80s with what I would call the space movement. And I do see that many of my colleagues, friends from those days, are now involved in the investment and financial side and the business side. And, uh, you know, definitely uh, Starbridge Venture Capital, one of our partners in this enterprise, definitely trace their roots back to the early days, and yet they're definitely obeying the laws of economics and finance as well. So, I do think uh, I do think we see an evolution there, and uh, and I think it's a fascinating thing overall. Um, where do you think we are at this point? You know, 
you pointed out in one of your writings that before 2009, there really wasn't any private investment to speak of in the field. And now there's a lot of it. I mean, a really large amount. Um, where where do we stand today and where are we going? Yeah, I think your characterization is uh, accurate in the sense that, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I reflect with people at how we get impatient for a quick evolution uh, and progress in a sector. And if you think about how quickly actually the space sector has evolved, given that it really only started in the 1950s uh, and we went from barely being able to do anything to being able to do so much and then struggling with the model we had built and then pivoting to a new model and then figuring out how to fund it. I mean, it's just amazing actually how quickly things have moved. And so the description you said, which is that basically over just a little more than the dec uh, last decade, we've seen a huge rise in private capital flows into space is really accurate. The, I had mentioned already actually space capital, and that's the, the source to which I tend to turn for data, uh, which many of your listeners probably do already. But uh, if not, it's that they have a really wonderful set of publicly available data on exactly these sorts of numbers. And I mean, we definitely do see a bit of a dip in 2022, as you would expect. And, you know, VC money, which is a, a venture capital money, which I think is a decent summary statistic for kind of the energy around new investment in space, it was about 12 billion in inflows last year. And uh, if I recall that that's down a bit from something higher in the upper teens the year before, and it sort of bounces around for the last few years between 15 and 20 or 12 and 20. So, um, you know, are we gonna start to see another big rise once we get kind of past COVID, past this maybe recession? Uh, I certainly hope so, but the flows over that decade plus have been, you know, really quite robust uh, and hopefully will remain so. So if you yeah, were to absolutely. guess, you'd think it's going to continue, it's going to be sustained, yeah? I would think so. And and I know we'll probably want to talk about Starship at some point, but the, there's a, yeah, definitely. there's a, you know, there's a big, potentially a big inflection point ahead of us. Uh, and what exactly that will do to private capital flows and activity is really hard to predict. Um, but I think those of us who believe in the market's ability to innovate and find ways to create opportunities that we can't foresee. Uh, that's like the part of the magic of the market. It suggests that growth is, is gonna be coming, especially if we keep pushing costs of doing stuff in space down. And so I would expect uh, there to be lots of opportunity for smart young startups and capitalists to, to make money. Brendan, I interrupted you at one point. I think you were gonna. No, no, it's, I'm, I'm glad you did. That was a, a good follow-up. Uh, yeah, I, when I think about the previous period, which I guess we're still on the tail end of, of space financing, huge booms, huge sums of money going into investing in technologies that I think of as, you know, infrastructure. This is helping build the infrastructure of the space economy. It's cheaper launch. It's uh, faster evolutions uh, to create uh, more, you know, innovative uh, satellites. It's really creating the the infrastructure for the space economy. Um, and so far we've seen lots of excitement, lots of uh, interesting technological developments, um, not a whole lot of uh, profitability uh, from these companies, uh, which nece hasn't necessarily been the goal, but I think that'll be ultimately with market forces driving the trend that will be the goal. What I'm excited for uh, in, in this phase is as we see more subspecialization, more people who can come in and build on top of this infrastructure that's being set out um, is people tackling really customer focused problems, problems that solve challenges for people here on earth that create exciting new ideas in space that will really add value. And so that's what I'm excited to see. If you look at a lot of the companies that are emerging today, it's let's say a remote sensing company that's uh, helping companies uh, evaluate their uh, you know, environmental impact and then do something about it. It's really focused product and information um, and, and that's something that I'm really excited about um, and there's a million other examples like that um, and so I, I certainly hope that good ideas like that will continue to get funded um, in, in this environment it seems like they they are that really does speak to another concept that you've popularized and I think it's good to share with the audience and maybe talk about what it means and you've talked about space for space and space for earth 
actually <laughs> in reverse order. What's the difference in space for Earth and space for space? Sure. Uh, so almost everything that happens in space right now is space for Earth, <laughs> roughly speaking, uh, in the sense that it is activity in space meant to benefit humans on Earth and primarily directly. So through things that humans on Earth use directly. And it's not a surprise in a way that that's almost everything we do in space because almost every human lives on Earth. And so it's hard to do much for humans that aren't on Earth uh, other than the folks in the space station. Uh, but we coined this term, uh, and this was also in cooperation with a former uh, colleague of mine at HBS, Mahek Sarang, uh, who helped write this article. Just the idea is that as we continue to expand our capabilities in space, more and more of what we do will eventually be to serve demands or to supply demands that are in space itself. Uh, and that could be from people living in space. It could be from activities in space uh, that are in some sense confined largely to space. And so indirectly, of course, they benefit us on the planet, but there is a use case in space. And I think the one that uh, is most probably salient to most of your listeners is, of course, the increased activity on the moon and in cis lunar space, uh, which increasingly has direct applications up there and maybe even a small population of people up there in the not too distant future. There's also the whole question of space tourism and whether that will take off. And to the extent that these commercial stations are holding our hosting space tourists, they will directly be doing space for space activities uh, for the people up there. Yeah, indeed. Uh, space tourism seems increasingly closer with Blue Origin and Virgin and also the private space stations being built. And yeah, I do have to stop for a moment because some of my fans are going to be concerned at the language that I'm using here. Because I'm always saying, the Earth is in space. We're always going to be in space. And uh, <laughs> and I talk about Earth as the first space community. And uh, I talk about Salyut, right. Soviet space station, as the second space community. And however, um, having said that, that's my little advertisement for my uh, framework. I know that we're never going to stop saying space and earth, space and earth. So uh, I don't want you to change your language, but uh, I do have to put in a plug for. No, that, that's uh, good, Frank. I'll put an asterisk next to it next time we uh, <laughs> use the term and, and clarify. Because, you know, it's funny you say that, actually, when I teach. Um, actually, not the space course so much, but when I teach other classes, I sometimes bring in some space topics to mm -hmm. help people think about it. and tell people think about earthly problems through a slightly different lens. And I often close with the observation that when you think about some of the dreams of utopian space colonies and how you would structure them and all that, that, that that's, that's useful for when we have space colonies, which I know we're all interested in, but it's also useful because we are the first space colony. Like that, yeah. that's what earth is. And so let's not forget that. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. And, and uh, as long as humans are there, uh, human behavior will be an issue. And of course, that, you know, that's going to be a big question for idealists and business people. Will those who live off of the planet, if you will, will they have different behaviors? Will, will they have a different uh, paradigm? In my writing, I've tried to suggest that they will, because just their worldview will be different because the way they view the world will be dramatically different. Um, and I do think that even uh, business people are gonna have to think about that as to <clears throat> whether the market is gonna be different because the people will be different. And uh, yeah. it, it, it's a, uh, um, I guess we would call it exo-economics or something like that. Uh, is is the you talked about <laughs> I don't want to get off the topic here but you talked about the timelessness of economics yeah. and and one wonders will that hold up when people are living in these dramatically new environments we don't know we that's don't an know. excellent that's, I love it I love it let's go there let's do it I mean this is why I got interested in this because you know I think economists like to think we ask the biggest questions of how societies work right that's right. I used to call economics the astrophysics of society 
Um, and, and I think that an economist would say, look, the fundamentals of economics won't change because they're, they're not really specific to any particular aspects of human nature. They, they are capacious enough to include any variation on that <laughs> that we can imagine. And I think, I think there's something to that, but I think what you say is also right, which is that that might be true. And nevertheless, the way that uh, those rules or laws will manifest do change depending on how humans act. And the simplest example I can give is, is the frontier economy, which is very relevant to space. I mean, we know that frontier economies are different and there's been actually pretty some interesting research on that. And uh, I think that could actually have some implications for not only the role of policy and the state, but on what we might expect from uh, the settlements in space and what they, how they would operate and, and how we would wanna uh, govern them. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and I think again, one of the interesting things about this field of study is we don't know everything and there are variables we can't really nail down based on a lot of knowledge. Brendan, thoughts on, on this? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a brilliant conversation and, and one that I, I wish we had more. Just to add on to it, I think one thing that's fascinating, we we're talking about different behaviors in space and some of the connotations around the mythology of space. Um, one example that comes to mind is there seems to be a real deep-seated human aversion to conflict in space, armed conflict in space, something about the nature of space and how it brings out our aspirations and our desire to cooperate um, is something that's beautiful and, and people seem really reluctant um, to have uh, human conflict extend into space, and we've taken great pains to to avoid that. Um, even at the same time, while you know, including some of the news over the past few weeks, we have little aversion to conflict on Earth. Um, I, I think it's just a, an interesting example of as we are able to do more and more in space, what will what decisions will we make about who we are as a species, how we behave with one another, how we organize societies, and and uh, behave uh, around one another. Um, what will stay the same? And as we do in more, more and more, what will change? Um, those are huge decisions that we'll have to make and make very deliberately. Yeah, and one of the elements of this that I try to emphasize when I'm talking to people who are not as up to date and immersed in it as we are, is that we have choices right now, today. This is not science fiction. Decisions are being made right now that will affect that future. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people who will be affected don't know about it. Um, a colleague of mine mentioned recently that she was concerned at an article that came out about the recent Chinese balloon and the three uh, UAPs that have been shot down. There, an article came out said the Chinese are interested in war space, war in near, near space. Um, you know, thinking about it as a battleground, and as you say, Brendan, that's been somewhat taboo. Uh, the idea laid out by President Kennedy many years ago that we had this opportunity to choose whether we project these aggressive tendencies outward or not. But I do believe whatever our opinion is about what should be done, it would be great to have more opinions. And we don't have a lot. I mean, it's it's pretty uh, it's a pretty restricted conversation, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great point. And just to, to put a cap on that. I think that's one of the reasons this is uh, one of Matt's ideas, which I think is brilliant, is in the conclusion of the course, obviously we run through, throughout the course, we run through some, you know, deep dives into the questions of financing and economics and building businesses and all that. But we conclude with uh, the question of, well, what is your vision? As all the students in the room, what is your vision for the future in space? Right. We discuss how to build it, some of the questions that'll come up, but really what it comes down to is individuals making decisions about um, what to do, and in this case, what to do in, in the space domain. And, and so I think that's a really powerful question that puts a lot of people on their heels and prompts them to think, well, what do what does my future in space look like? What do I want it to be? 
I also, I'll just, sorry to keep this going, but this is such an interesting conversation. Uh, as much as Brendan and I focus on the business of space and the economics of space, which is, you know, I think really important and exciting and all that. I think that these questions are so fundamental that it's also really important that we have people, and I don't mean to be, you know, flattering you too much, Frank, but <laughs> people like Frank who write books and do podcasts and emphasize these questions to a broader audience. And I, you know, I also think about the folks, MIT has various folks who have really tried to democratize space and they right. talk about it in those terms. And I, th I just think it's great to have a wide range of folks in the space sector also beating this drum that we want more people in, we want more people helping us figure this out, so, yeah. I agree. I think there's an analogy that I've made recently and I think it might be apt there is a lot of talk in the space community about democratization, underserved communities getting involved, mm -hmm. which I'm totally in favor of, inclusion. And I'm struck by uh, what has happened with artificial intelligence, which has been lurking on the sidelines for many, many years. Uh, the term was coined in 1955. It's been the domain of engineers and, and programmers and people who you know are fascinated with computers and all of a sudden it's all over the place uh, and it's because of one application called chat gpt um and one thing that hasn't been talked about much is the reason it's everywhere right now is that it was put on open ai and it was free and it, it is democratized now a lot of people have criticized them for letting this thing loose on the world. And I know uh, from experience that a lot of universities are not sure what to do about it. However, that is why artificial intelligence is something that many, many people now think is important. I don't think we we're quite there with space exploration where mm -hmm people really feel, going back to Brendan's point, oh, I have a say, I can access this, I can see myself, you know? I'm not quite sure what it would take, but uh, I do believe that's when it will become apparent to everybody that it matters to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. One quick data point that I thought was fascinating that was sort of lost in this whole fiasco with the, you talk, mentioned the Chinese uh, reconnaissance balloon and the UAPs. I was reading articles about it and I thought it was fascinating that as a footnote, they said, now of course, China's primary, uh, primary reconnaissance uh, capability are there 260, you know, very advanced remote sensing satellites that are constantly taking pictures of us uh, all the time. <laughs> but no, yeah, one, right. no one really, is. it's just a function yeah. of, of human psychology that we yeah. don't talk about it. It's taken as fact that that's happening. But all of a sudden, when you can see it, um, because it's much that closer matters. to Earth and it's much larger, then the whole world freaks out. Um, I, I thought it was fascinating for me that people really do care about these issues, like the one you're talking about. They just might not know about it. Um, and uh, that'll change, I think. Yeah. Well, I did want to uh, go back to another question uh, that's focused on the economic side. The concept that space commerce will be a trillion dollar economy is one of those statements that's been repeated so often that everybody believes it. I wonder, do you believe it? Is so, it real? Sure, at some point it will be a trillion dollar economy if for no other reason than inflation will. No, I'm being facetious. Uh, okay, so it really depends what you mean by the space economy, how you measure. Economists have a hard time with all these kinds of calculations because the whole economy is stitched together. So it's hard to know where to draw lines, but let's ignore those concerns for a little bit. The Space Foundation says that the space economy is $469 billion last year. So what they mean by that is revenue. Um, fine, let's just take that number and say that's what people mean when they say it'll be a trillion dollars by some point. Um, you know, I think we're already in 2022, 2023 now. So, to reach, say, a trillion by 2030, which is a number I remember hearing at various points, uh, that's a pretty that's a pretty fast clip, actually. That's you know that's over 10% a year for sure. Um, 
I haven't run the actual calculation, but it's definitely over 10. Um, and I don't know, I, I have a little hard, I have a hard time seeing that in the sense that I think there's parts mm. of the space sector that are not growing very fast at all. In fact, that are enormous parts of the space sector. Um, so now I think there are parts that will grow at that faster rate and that would be really exciting. Um, but I guess I would put it a little further off than that. There's actually, if, if your listeners are really interested in the growth of the space economy in a carefully uh, measured way, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has a measuring the space economy program now. And it's run by this wonderful economist, Tina Heifel. Uh, and she and I have done a little work together, but she's really the driving force behind those data. And the numbers are quite a bit smaller than the ones that you tend to see in space publications. And that's just because they draw the lines slightly differently, but it's it's less about the level and about the growth rates. Um, and I think that's the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis is the place I would look for, for those numbers. That's good to know. I do worry about hype. Right. Uh, you know, um, I'm a communications person, as I said, and I know why that number is being bandied about, but it it's sometimes difficult if you raise expectations too much. Yeah, um, exactly. A similar term is the cis lunar economy. What do you think about that? And uh, what do you think it's going to take to really break out of low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit and and actually have some kind of significant economic activity in the region between the Earth and the Moon. So on the cis-lunar economy, I think there, there really are prospects there for some economic activity. I think some at a pretty low level, and then, of course, the dreams are much bigger. There's a certain amount of just scientific and other activity that, and activity that is sort of public goodsy in terms of exploration and things that we just want to do as governments. Um, that I think is wonderful and actually will bring with it billions of dollars in public sector funding and create lots of wonderful innovation and technologies for a lot of companies. So I think that's that's kind of traditional NASA stuff, but done through somewhat more modern decentralized contracting methods that we've learned about over the past couple of decades. And I'm I think that's really exciting. It's not huge. Um, huge would be if we can find resources on the moon that are incredibly valuable because we figure out how to mine them and use them in ways like that, or if we develop, you know, other other things in the cis lunar economy, whether it's tourism or otherwise, that are a whole new scale of operation. Uh, I don't know how likely that is, uh, but there are definitely people putting money behind that possibility. Mm -hmm. Brendan, you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I think one thing that's really interesting about the moon is that it presents a whole new set of opportunities and challenges, even beyond the experiment we've seen in near earth space that the government's doing and, and been trying to privatize that and commercialize that the, the moon is a whole different can of worms i mean it's much much harder to get to um and the value proposition you know matt was saying earlier how space for earth is a huge huge part of the space economy i think when you wrote that article matt you estimated it was about 95 percent of the space economy i mean being able to do space for earth type functions which are really the bedrock of this economy there's not a whole lot of those that you can do from the moon. It's really a space for space play. So that's a change from the traditional space economies we think of it today. But the opportunities is, you know, unlike near Earth space, there's a huge set of resources that exist there. Um, there's, you can land there, you can explore, you can exploit materials. There's a real upside uh, when it comes to the moon. Um, that's really interesting. And, and I was just reading the news today that, uh, Blue Origin, one of the companies that's uh, interested in the moon, uh, is prototyping um, a new form of electrolysis, essentially, to be able to convert just pure lunar regolith, lunar soil, into uh, solar panels, the material for solar panels. So that's one of those opportunities where, you know, the challenges are huge, and the government will be driving that the effort to get there and to create a sustained presence. But man, if, if some of these companies can uh, innovate and find a way to make the most out of what it means to be on the moon, then there's a huge potential upside there, um, mm -hmm. though it might take some time. Um, so that's, it, it's really an exciting question, I think. I think it could be an extension of space tourism, because mm -hmm. to be a tourist, you need somewhere to go. And in the near term, of course, space tourists are gonna go to these new space stations. But one good thing about the moon is you don't have to build it. It's it's built. You have to build on it, of course. You have to use it in some way, but it's there. It's already there. 
Um, I love that quote. Can we use that when we talk about this winter? <laughs> That's fantastic. A great thing about you the moon use is it. you don't have to build it. I love that. <laughs> you can use it. Also, do you know the joke about the restaurant on the moon? I'd love to hear it. I don't know it. I don't know if you do, Matt. No. Great view, no atmosphere. No. <laughs> oh. I'll stop Very good. while I'm Very ahead. Good. <laughs> uh, that's not my joke. I heard it from somewhere else. But in any event, uh, kind of a two-pronged question. Um, we talk about public-private partnerships and all of that and commercialization, but I have to say it's pretty much an American idea. Uh, and two-pronged question, what is, what is the role of NASA and government in the future of American space? But then there's a completely different model in China, mm. or I think it's different, tell me if I'm wrong, but what about countries where it's still going to be primarily government? What does that look like, and how do the two different approaches coexist? Mm. That's a great question. I guess, let me start. Uh, with the American part. And I, the thing that I've always thought was really insightful in terms of as NASA thinks about the evolution of its role uh, is that NASA has, <laughs> has always wanted to focus on the stuff that the private sector can't do. They haven't talked about that very much because we haven't had much of a private sector uh, active in space on its own. But but NASA loves in some ways the idea of turning more and more of low earth orbit and other things over to the private sector so it can go out into deep space. It can do that stuff that the private sector, at least at the moment, can't find a way to make money on. And so just reinforcing that idea that it's not that NASA is going away or becoming less important, it's that they're able to devote their limited funds to what they do best and the same for the private sector, I feel like is the the right way to think at the first step. And that's partly this decentralization thing. But coming back to the framework, there are still roles that the public sector can play in, as an economist would say, sort of internalizing various externalities that, that these private sector companies can't quite get. And so part of it, some of those are positive, right? So uh, there's a bit of a happy cycle, a virtuous cycle in terms of the development of a sector like this. And NASA can get that ball rolling with some early funding for startups and plugging some gaps where they exist and just trying to create a whole greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, and then of course, I think everyone listening to this is aware of some of the negative externalities from space debris and other things where we need private, we need public sector players to step in and kind of, or we might need them to step in uh, if the, the private sector can't internalize them themselves. Uh, and and sort of raise the red flag and put incentives in place. So I think that, but my sense is that that relationship, though of course there's going to be fits and starts, has been evolving pretty healthily in the U.S. When you ask about other countries, I mean, I don't know, Brendan, you probably want to weigh on in on this too. I think there's some countries that are just at an earlier stage, and so they don't have a private space sector that can really live on its own very well. It might try to slot into various aspects of the supply chain, etc., that's coming largely out of the U.S. Uh, and Europe and and that's great, um, but they, if they're smaller countries especially, they will probably be running most of their space activities through the government, uh, piggybacking off of these larger space programs. And then, of course, there's China, uh, which has a very different way of thinking about a lot of things, uh, including uh, how to think about the space sector. And look, China's had an amazingly successful space program. I guess I tend to believe that having the private sector not be quite as hand in glove with the state will actually end up being a real advantage for the U.S. relative to the more centrally controlled system um, that China is working with. But we'll see. Brendan, what do you yeah, think? I, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and my takeaway is that we're, we're fortunate as space enthusiasts to live in the United States. We have a large and very well-developed um, public space agency that is encouraging commercialization. Um, we have uh, a set of uh, entrepreneurs and investors who are really excited about space, are funding space projects, and we're, we're seeing so much uh, development such that, once again, the United States Space Program, commercial and public, is, is the envy of the world. Um, and uh, it's, we're glad, you know, I'm glad to be in the United States. Um, other countries certainly have opportunities to uh, make their mark in the future of space. Um, I think the 
approaches will have to be a little bit different um, just because not every country is, is the same. I remember uh, recently, I, I want to get the quotation exactly right. I don't know if it will. It's a representative from the European Space Agency essentially saying, look, we're not the United States. We're, we're going to have a different approach. Um, you know, they've had a lot of success, but it's going to be a little bit different here. And then obviously China's a whole whole another can of worms. Um, the, the closer you look at the the development of their capabilities, you know, you start um, seeing more and more mentions of the People's Liberation Army and, and, and things like that. It's a, a different approach that they have there and one that we should pay attention to uh, very carefully. Um, but yeah, my takeaway is that, you know, our, our approach to space certainly is not perfect in the United States, but boy, is it uh, an exciting time and, and an exciting place to be. Yeah, so many, uh, so many technologies <clears throat> and innovations have been public-private partnerships like the internet, the airline industry. It's a, again, we, we do think of space as dramatically different and in other ways, it's very consistent with the way things have been done. One of the areas that interests me is bringing the environmental movement, the space movement back together. Uh, Gerard K. O'Neill was a mentor of mine and his vision is still pretty powerful that if a significant number of people and industries were located off of planet Earth, it would be good for the Earth, uh, reducing our, our stress on the carrying capacity of the planet. The, the challenge I've seen in this, in the research I've done, is that you've really got to go big or go home. In other words, when Elon Musk says, I'm going to put a million people on Mars, everybody says, oh, wow, a million people. But the problem is that won't have any real impact on the terrestrial population because we've got 8 billion people. And it could really strain Mars. Uh, we don't know much about what Mars can deal with. So do you think this could get big enough that the, the O'Neillian idea that we could have really, really large numbers of people and activities stretching out into a larger ecosystem that would actually make a difference here on the Earth. Do you think it's really possible? The realm of the speculative. Uh, this is a tough one. I, I'll give you my first thoughts on this. Right? So I if I were worried about the environmental, well, I am. So given that I am worried about the environmental sustainability of the planet, I would not look to space, uh, to space's ability to be an escape valve or something as the way to solve that problem. I think we can do a lot of great environmental things from space uh, in terms of Earth observation and potentially even really important things like space-based solar, which is quite speculative, but could be a big deal. You know, will it solve our environmental problems fast enough? Uh, I wouldn't bet on it. So I would do all the other things we're doing. Um, even though I am actually quite an optimist, I think, on the eventual potential of space to house many, many humans. But I wouldn't go to the environmental arguments first, I think, at least not the short term ones. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, I'm really encouraged by there seems to be a real thread in the space community of folks who really do care about the environment. And that is in part what brought them to the space community. I'm thinking, for example, of um, the folks at Planet, uh, publicly traded remote, right. remote sensing company who are deeply involved and deep believers in the ability of space technology to solve problems on Earth. And they've had tremendous results already. Um, I'm not sure about when that tipping point will happen, the, the tipping point where we start moving activities into space. Um, but something that I think we can look for in the near future is what is the impact of a system like Starship, you know, which not only is its lift capacity much, much greater, but because of the shape and the payload size and, and the capacity, you can start doing more and more different kinds of things in space. You can start redefining what a spacecraft looks like. Um, you know, it'll, it'll take time for these kinds of things to develop, but that's one thing that I'm, I'm watching for is, you know, do we start thinking about traditional space activities differently? Um, satellites look different. Can we start really putting more people up in space? Um, what does that look like? And one last thing I'll tag is that I'm not sure to what extent the number of people we have in space is directly tied to our ability to uh, have ambitious space goals. I'm a believer in 
uh, automation and, and just you can, as we get better and better at software and and, and uh, really integrating innovative software and some of these next generation hardware space concepts, I think that um, it is a much faster path to have autonomous systems in space. Um, and it just makes it easier for people who are excited and, and want to uh, achieve some of these ambitious goals faster. I think not having to have everything be human rated and bring up all of our own water and oxygen and everything. It's um, it, it helps me sleep at night knowing, okay, I don't necessarily have to survive up there for whatever system up there uh, to make an impact back here on earth. Brendan, I know that we're uh, close to the end of your visit. Um, do you want to have any final words? I just want to say it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, just the ability to talk with you after all the work that you've done and continue to do in this sector uh, is a real honor and a pleasure. Um, I, I think your books, especially on the overview effect, are required reading for anyone who calls himself a space enthusiast. Um, and so uh, as someone who's been the beneficiary of your perspective, uh, I just want to say thank you for, for that. And it was a real pleasure to, to have the chance to talk with you. Thank you, Brendan. Thanks for the kind words. and. Uh... You know, I, I really appreciate it when people, it, writing a book is its own reward, but I really appreciate it when it makes a difference too, you know? Um, Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you Brendan. I'll leave you to it. Bye, Brendan. So Matt, uh, if we can take a little more time. Yeah. I would love to talk about, um, you know, the Starship singularity. <laughs> um, my friends at Starbridge Venture Capital, I believe coined the phrase, uh, there is a belief that if Starship works, it's not an incremental change, but something mm -hmm. more, which Brendan mentioned. What do you think? Will Starship be as impactful on the economics as we imagine? Right, I think it's a really important question. The you know, if you think, again, going back to sort of Econ 101, the first thing you learn is the supply and demand diagram. And the best way to think about a supply curve is as the cost curve. And what Starship has the potential to do is push that supply curve way out <laughs> to the right by pushing costs down dramatically. And whenever that happens, if you remember your supply and demand diagrams, you get to move down that demand curve. And that just means that more and more things that you might want to have done in space suddenly become doable, right? And, and so I think that's when people talk about the singularity, they, they think that, you know, SpaceX may not actually face the pricing pressure to bring prices down to how their costs, how low their costs could go, because who's going to push them? But at the same time, we will, I'm sure, see a decline in costs. And, and they do have some people trying to chase them. So to the extent that that does lower the cost of doing all sorts of things, it's actually uh, wonderfully hard to predict the sorts of changes we might see. And I've heard many people in the sector say things like, and all bets are off, everything changes uh, when that comes to fruition. So I don't know, it's, of course, by its nature, it's very hard to predict, but uh, the, the, the specific things that, you know, you mentioned and Brendan mentioned for sure, right, that the difference in how we think about designing satellites or building satellites, the, the differences in how we think about moving resources up into space to sustain people or to do really large scale activities, even space debris. I mean, even ways we think about capturing space debris. There's so many things that might change uh, that... I guess I am one of those folks who thinks it may have a really transformational effect on, on what we do. It makes me wonder if it might be like chat GPT because mm -hmm. suddenly, I mean, with chat GPT, all of a sudden there are things you can do with AI that you couldn't do the day before. And, exactly. uh, you know, I just wonder if it will be that dramatic. And I, I'm of the opinion one thing I like about academics is the wait, wait and see, and let's get some data. And, you know, people insisted to me that you could not experience the overview effect on a suborbital hop. Mm. And I said, well, I, we don't have a lot of experience with suborbital hops, so let's wait and see. And I've interviewed five or six people who flew on Blue Origin flights, and 
you can have a really dramatic experience. And yeah. we didn't we didn't think that would happen. It was unlikely. So we'll see. I mean, if Elon Musk makes good, we'll find out because he will yeah. he'll make it work. Um, and I will, I'll also say just Frank one of those things. I uh, Brendan had to leave for those of you uh, listening, but one thing that Brendan uh, and I don't we see uh, a lot of things very similarly in the sector. But one thing that we have a very happy uh, debate about uh, frequently is the role of humans going forward in space. He's more on the automation skeptical of humans in space side, and I'm more on the humans have to be in the mix side. Um, and I think part of the reason I perhaps tend towards that is when I think about the space for space economy, I tend to think that an economy is really just humans trading with each other. And so if you want a big economy in space, you got to have people in space. Um, and when I think about some of the potential of Starship, it's about making, of course, the automated activities of space cheaper and more possible, but it also opens up whole new possibilities for putting us up there in a sustainable way, which is, you know, something that I think people in the sector, many people deep in the sector have a lot of skepticism about. It's probably healthy skepticism. It's a big, hard thing to do to put people up there. Uh, but I retain a little bit of the idealism about that. Yeah, and I I understand it. I mean, uh, I think it's a difference between a focus on missions and a focus on migration. Mm -hmm. And there is a recent book that came out, you know, it's called something like The End of Astronauts. Yeah. And it's all about we don't really need astronauts anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we can use AI and robots. And that's true if your focus is a mission. Uh, mm -hmm. We can definitely automate more of it. If your focus is on evolution of society and trying out new ways of governing and mm -hmm. new uh, economics, and if you're interested in opening things up a bit, then it is more like a migration. It's more like people getting out there and doing things. So mm -hmm. I guess you have to choose what seems most uh, most important. Um, I don't want to forget one of the topics I find most challenging to grasp. That's the stag hunt. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I know you've written about the stag hunt, how it applies to space. Uh, yeah. Can you briefly describe what the stag hunt is and how it applies? Yeah. Sure, I'd love to. And actually, it, it actually connects to the topic we were just on, I think, in an interesting way. So uh, many of your listeners will be familiar with the game theory concept of the prisoner's dilemma, right? Um, so I won't go over that. It's all over the internet. If you're curious to learn about that, if you're not familiar with it, it's a good thing to learn about. Um, the stag hunt is a bit of a variation on that classic game, and it has one really big difference, which is in the prisoner's dilemma, there's only one uh, basic equilibrium in the normal notion of it, and it's kind of a unhappy equilibrium. These two prisoners end up in a place that they both wish they weren't, but they can't figure out how to get out of it, that equilibrium. In the stag hunt, you have two different equilibria. And so in brief, the game is that there's two hunters. Each of them can separately kill a rabbit, but if they cooperate, they can kill a deer or a stag. And there's two equilibria of this game. One is that each hunter goes off and hunts a rabbit by themselves. They each get a rabbit. They're pretty happy with that. The other equilibrium is they both hunt the deer together. They get the deer and they're really happy because the payoff of getting a deer together is much higher. Both of those are stable. Once you're in either of those equilibria, nobody has a um, temptation to go to cheat out of it, which is what makes it different from a prisoner's dilemma. But the stag hunt is often used to talk about situations in which we're in, say, the rabbit-rabbit equilibrium, where we're kind of getting small wins. How do we get over the tipping point? How do we switch equilibria to where we're really swinging for the fences? And so I use that in space because I think uh, it's a helpful way to think about, you know, we can kind of keep hitting singles, so to speak, hunting rabbits, or we can really swing for the fences, uh, mixing metaphors here. And uh, and what would it take to do that? And so there's a, there's a couple of natural ways to switch from one equilibrium to the next one. One is through, say, the activities of venture capitalists. So venture capitalists, the whole game or the whole thing they're doing is incentivizing risk taking, right, by by pouring money into all these startups, and then they take a bit off the top for the few that really succeed. And yeah. so what they're, one way to understand what they're trying to do is encourage people to switch from rabbits to deer. <laughs> uh, and the more we do that, the more you might get those big game. 
uh, hunts. The other thing is, this is actually in some ways, there's a big term out there in the space sector that some of your listeners will have heard of, which is vertical integration. This idea that part of what makes SpaceX SpaceX or relativity is that they just own the whole value chain and, and that you see that with SpaceX, with Starlink and so on. One way to understand, I think, the economics behind vertical integration is exactly this, that SpaceX or Elon Musk or <laughs> Gwen Shotwell, whomever, realize that there are, there's a possibility to switch from the small to the big equilibrium, and they're just going to do it themselves. They're just going to right. own the whole thing and go. So that's what that's about. So can you imagine, and this will be my last question until I ask you to summarize, can you imagine having Elon Musk in one of your classes? He what is always Elon? welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Elon, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> yes. No, we, we have wonderful guests in our classes, uh, really amazing people uh, who visited us. We've never had Elon, but why yeah. do you ask about Elon in particular, Frank? He just seems such a rogue and a rebel. I just, I think Elon at Harvard Business School would just be uh, oil and water, but maybe not. I mean, uh, maybe you know, he would be just the right person. Yeah, I mean, we have such a wide array of people who visit the class, just to give your listeners a, a sense. I mean, uh, last year, we had both Lori Garber and Charlie Bolden in subsequent sessions, which was just such a trip yeah, uh, to hear their yeah. different perspectives on the on the time they had in Washington. And we have lots of founders. Dylan Taylor visited our class um, and various alums of the school who are in really exciting positions in the space sector from Ariane Cornell to Joe Landon to Peter Platzer and uh, Dan Nevia. So it's just a wonderful community of people. And, and we like the rebels. We like the people who are challenging things. You know, Frank, I, I realized I forgot to tie two uh, ribbons together, which was this idea on the stag hunt and then the idea of the role of humans in space. Because yeah. sometimes when I talk about the stag hunt thing, people say, okay, wait, what's the stag? Like, what, <laughs> what are you hoping that we'll go get? so to speak. And I basically say it's humans in space. I basically say, I think that's the big thing that it's really hard to hunt for by yourself. But if we all agree that that's part of what we're trying to do, uh, the payoff could be really extraordinary. Yeah, cool. Um, is there a question I should have asked and I didn't? Uh, that'll be your last question. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Uh, there's only one thing that I, you know, I, I'm sure your listeners are generally space people, because um, that's still the case for most space podcasts and publications and all that. But one thing that we've been really trying to push forth at HBS, uh, and we have a recent Harvard Business Review article on this, and, and I hope that any of your listeners who don't work for space companies, but maybe work for normal quote unquote companies, uh, will pick up on this, which is that we really hope, as we try to expand the reach of space, and it's salience in people's lives and its ability to have impact that normal companies will start to think very hard about their space strategy uh, increasing capabilities on the data side uh, even on the communication side of course on internet of things side but but even eventually on manufacturing and r d at these commercial stations uh, that i think a much wider range of companies are going to start taking advantage of and even if even if you're not, your competitor probably will. And so uh, if we could get it to be part of the discussion in Fortune 500 boardrooms, you know, what is our space strategy? I think we would really get the wheels of innovation turning uh, to the benefit of us all. Well, Matt, I wanna thank you. And I certainly enjoyed talking with Brendan as well. This has been a really stimulating, interesting discussion. Um, I think I got a B plus in economics. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it was my best subject, but it is fascinating and it's it's certainly unavoidable uh, anytime we think about any human enterprise. So thank you for shedding so much light on the economics of space. Thank you so much, Frank. What a pleasure to be with you.